This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. If you're a fan of salsa, you probably know who Pete Bonet is. The man is a Latin music icon, and he's got a story that'll make you believe anything is possible if you have passion, determination, and talent. Check out the Corso, the real Nyorican salsa story. They call me a legend. They, I, I worked over with over 40 bands, orchestras, including Tito Puente and and many other famous like Ray Barreto, Mongo, Santa Maria, La Lupe, Celia Cruz. Uh, Tito Puente was one of the last ones that I worked with. And we traveled everywhere. I went to Africa uh, with uh, James Brown, together with James Brown. I did the Apollo Theater twice, once uh, with Ray Barreto and uh, James Brown, and another time uh, with Mongo Santa Maria. And uh, Arthur Prysak was there and many other stars, you know. And uh, I wrote about the truth about salsa music, how the salsa name came about, you know. Because uh, it's all Cuban music. It's called Wawanko, Son Montuno, all that stuff, you know, all, that, all those uh, Cuban names. And uh, I had a club in New York called the Corso. And it became number one in the Latin community. It was on 86th Street and 3rd Avenue in Manhattan. Even people from England, from London, would come and they did writings about the Corso. From a club that nobody knew, I turned it into Latin music. And I used to give uh, nine uh, bands a week. And Wednesday night, we used to have a contest the best salsa dancers, and I will give them a bottle of champagne after they dance. You know, I will pick out the best dancers. And at 12 o'clock, we start the show. And it was incredible, you know. And uh, a lot of movie stars would come in, like Harry Belafonte. Where I, uh, there's photographs with me and Harry Belafonte and Tito Puente. There's 90 pages of photographs. George Hamilton used to come in a lot. So I, I worked in, in Hollywood. I was the manager of Playboy Club. <laughs> I had been there before with Ray Barreto a few times, played all over Hollywood. And then I, I went with Tito Puente a few times. And the second time that I went with Tito, I decided to stay in California. And uh, I started a band and I was hired by a piano player, singer, and actress to accompany her in Playboy. And we did great for two weeks. And they called me in Playboy. They wanted me to do a show, but I was looking for a job. You know, I had my four kids and I, I needed a job. Uh, the book was released, but I've been doing my own promoting. Uh, people, uh, you know, they call me from Colombia. They call me from uh, Italy. They call me from Spain and all over the United States. And I talk to the people. I talk on the radio. So for a Puerto Rican that had no shoes, when he was eight years old, that was me. I put on shoes for the first time when I was eight years old. And I came to New York almost 16 years old. And I couldn't speak English. I didn't even know how to say no in English. And uh, I think I did a lot of stuff, you know, for, for a kid that came from Puerto Rico with nothing. Yeah, you sure did do a lot of stuff. Thank you so much, Pete. Our next author shows us the strength of the human spirit. Jennifer Jameson Woods shares her story about love, loss of a child, drowning in despair, and finding her way in her book entitled No Guarantees. I, I was born and raised in Ontario, Canada, in a small town. And I went from there to Anchorage, Alaska in the 1970s which was the time of the big oil boom in Alaska, where, you know, there were, what, four to one men. And I fell in love with this Alaskan man and moved into a cabin with him out in the middle of nowhere, you know, with no running water and no electricity. And a big, huge storm came in and we were socked in for two plus weeks. And I got pregnant and he wanted me to have an abortion. And and I did not want to have an abortion, and so I chose not to. And we ended up getting married. He was always distant, never connected to the pregnancy, pretty much pissed off about it the whole time. 
did not want to move into town to have the baby. You know, I was all concerned about having a baby out in the middle of nowhere. And comes the time for the baby, and they couldn't hear a heartbeat. And there was some concern about the position of the baby. So I had an x-ray, and they realized that it was placenta previa. So they did an emergency cesarean. And um, when I woke up, my hands were tied. And the nurse said, because you were trying to pull out your IV, and she said the baby was stillborn. Yeah, yeah, it was a pretty traumatic event. And I, I ended up, of course, breaking up with this guy. Um, and then I got a job at an institution for children with developmental disabilities. But I went down a long, dark road of alcoholism, working every day, but drinking every night, drinking all weekend blacking out, sleeping with my sleazy roommate. Finally, I ended up moving in with a woman from work, and she could not abide with my drinking. She finally kicked me out, and I was taken in by a man I met at a bar, of course, and he was headed out to the slope, so he let me stay in his house, let me drive his truck. And there was a woman at work, a nurse, who saw that I had the ability and the um, skill in working with these children with developmental disabilities. And at that time, in 1974, there was a public law passed that allowed for the education of special ed children in public schools. That had not been the case prior to that. And so she helped me get set up to go to Washington State to pursue a degree in special education. I got sober. I um, got a job. But I had a student who came from Alaska whose name was the same name that I had given my baby. And it put me in a tailspin. I was on the verge of falling apart. Um, I finally told my sponsor what happened about the baby. And she said, maybe you should get the records. So I did. I sent away and, and there in the records were the footprints of the baby. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. can't believe this is a true story. And so the, the footprints gave me something to see I'd never seen anything that had to do with my baby, you know, it was just like I was going to have a baby and then he was gone. And so I saw these footprints and I went and bought a bottle of gin and um, there was a knock at the door and it was teacher who I had connected with at school. He asked me, you know, did you drink? And I was like, no, no, I didn't. So I poured it out and I showed him the footprints and I could barely even say you know it was mine he held me on his lap as I cried and told him the whole story but I had never seen those footprints before so it was the only evidence of the baby that I had you know and it was kind of like closure for the whole experience I was like oh yes there was a baby and oh yes there is something to be sad very despondent about you know, and he said, but I see why you're such a caring person, why you're so um, good with your students is because you've been through hell and back. I tell you, it was writing the book in general was very cathartic, putting all this on on the page, getting it from my heart onto a page, you know, where I had a bit of distance from it and I could look at it. I wrote it in third person the character's name is Josie but as soon as I put it out there Alice I felt vulnerable just vulnerable it was kind of like oh my goodness now my story is out there you know there's no retracting it yeah. but anyway it's it's good to have it done because I do have another book that I want to work on I have a great many short stories that I'd like to put together in a um, small book you know I, that's my next plan okay yeah 
So yeah. maybe I'll talk to you again. Maybe. All right. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Sine Champion is a performance poet and a motivational speaker, and you are about to meet a woman who has found her calling, and she'll help you find yours in her book, ABCs of Self-Esteem Poetry on Purpose. Well, years ago, I was working with some of my dance students, choreographing a composition that required passionate, deep emotional input from their cores, you know, from their centers. And I was inspired to approach the work from the inside out. And I asked the kids to line up in front of the mirror and repeat after me positive affirmations, A to Z. And the words began to just just come out of me. I am assertive, I am balancing, I'm creative, decisive, enthusiastic, focused. And I went from A to Z. And then one day I wrote a poem, one little poem about one of the words and it was successful. And that poem says, I am first successful because I believe my chosen goal I will achieve. With patience, perseverance, and steady progress, my goal becomes a realized success. I had no idea I was going to write a book. And then it was the next week. I wrote another little poem. And then all of a sudden, it occurred to me that I'm writing poems A to Z. And with 26 of them and just staying focused here we are with my book abc's of self-esteem poetry on purpose nice do you want to read one to me oh sure one of my favorites is focus because i think that's where a lot of us need to begin i know i did focus and self-discipline are the keys to success act on a clear vision putting doubt to rest I am centered and mindful of my intention. I am focused. I direct my attention. Focus. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I see these poems as little tools that uh, anybody can use. And I wrote the book actually for everybody. With Even with little kids, you can take the ABC roster that all the poems are based on, A to Z, and have them learn those words. They don't have to know what they mean. Children don't know what any words mean at first. But if we give them something, A to Z, and if they would say, I am assertive, I am balancing, from there, we go into a poem. And um, example, I am wise. Observing and interacting with nature, life lessons abound. I grow smarter as I live the lessons I have found. With consciousness rising and awareness blossoming true, I seek to be attended by wisdom as I do the things I do. And the afterword for that is immerse. Have you been able to continue performing? Yes, um... I've been meeting with a small group of my students and just started a a Zoom account. I know Zoom's an amazing thing, isn't it? It's an amazing thing. In fact, I've been writing about everything. I wrote uh, a poem about helping to stop coronavirus. (laughs) It's not in my book, but it's something that I've written. It says, help stop coronavirus. Think, do. Things have changed. Take a world view. I hear social distance, act for sure. Mindfulness is part of the cure. I wash my hands, mask my face, need be, home is the place. Cooperation is a vital key, help stop coronavirus globally. So that's how I'm working through the pandemic. All right, Signy, good for you. We're going to take a quick break, but we're coming right back. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Attention all authors. Page Publishing is looking for authors. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, Apple iTunes, and other outlets. They handle all aspects of the publishing process for you. Printing, cover art, publicity, copyright, and editing. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. That's 800-204-6099 for your free author submission kit. 
We are back on the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Growing up a sci-fi fanatic and fan of Star Wars and Battlestar Galactica, Kurt Caulfield's imagination ran wild during long trips as an over-the-road truck driver. And now his sci-fi fantasy comes to life in The Orion Project. It's a a story about a... uh space mission to go colonate other planets and other solar systems and other galaxies. Caden Wayne is, is the, the main character, and his crew of friends, they're a couple generations into colonizing the, the uh, planet. There's a native species on, on the planet that's basically like uh, orangutan type uh, creatures and reptilian race that's set on universal do- domination that has their sights set on this planet and enslaving the native species. And in the time that they checked it out at first, and now that they're coming back to actually do what they want to do, the humans have, have landed. And that, that's basically where the story starts, is where the Camoleons are coming in to take over, and the humans and the native species, are their populations are getting big enough where they're starting to in, interact. And uh, the species that's trying to take over is captured and realizes these humans are better people than what what he grew up with. They're other, but like, like a Nazi type of race. They're all mi- military. They don't think along the lines of friends and compassion on people. It's just about dominate the universe. And at the same time, they also have the biotas that are the, the native creature of the planet. They're starting to interact, and one of them actually befriends uh, Caden. And, and the biotas, even though they're very primitive, they have a high capacity for, for learning. Once they start learning, they just grow in knowledge so quickly that he, he advances far beyond his, his brothers, so to speak, and kind of becomes a- alienated to them. This is the beginning. This is more like getting to know the basic characters, who's good, who's bad. And then I actually have plans to make it a four-book series. When they left Earth, there was a piloting crew and a crew in cryostatus that was supposed to do the colonization. The piloting crew was just to get them there. They had a preset solar system they were supposed to be headed for, but when uh, the crew comes out of the cryostatus, the piloting crew's gone, and they have no idea where they went to or how long it took them to to get, get, get there. The only records they have was before leaving Earth. So the, in, uh, in the third and fourth books, it kind of goes into, well, let's see if we can find Earth and figure out where we came from. And they find what they believe is Earth. I've got ideas for a fifth and sixth where they, they actually go into the Camolian homeworlds in hopes of freeing other species that they've enslaved. Man, that is one well-thought-out adventure, Kurt. I hope you get to write the whole series. Thank you. When it comes to relationships, Tammy Calderon feels compelled to help women make the best choices possible and lays it all out in her book, Men Come with a Price Tag. It's basically a dating smart advice book. It's to the traditional girl dating in this modern world. Tell me what a traditional woman is. Um, A traditional woman is that girl who still holds on to, you know, traditional values. She wants to be courted. She has certain expectations. You know, when she goes out on the date, you know, she's looking for more than just a hookup. She's looking, you know, to go out to dinner and to be courted. And I'm in advising women to be smart about dating, to slow down. I have a section in there at the end called calculate the cost, meaning evaluate your relationship. Think about whether or not this relationship is worth your time and emotions, because if you don't, you could end up spending uh, an emotional fortune trying to connect with and stay with a man that you were never supposed to be with in the first place. In the chapter called Good Girls Beware, I had met this guy at a conference. And I call him John Prevaricator because that man was just, he just lied, lied, lied for no reason at all. We hit it off, I mean, just magically. And we talked a lot on the phone before we even went out. And our first date, he took me to a restaurant overlooking the city of Los Angeles. And he had a big gift for me, wrapped in red satin. Anytime John and I went out, he always had a gift for me. And he had bought me on this particular uh, date 
a carousel and the music played somewhere in time. And so he said this was his favorite movie. And there was a line in that movie that said, you know, where have you been all of my life? I have been waiting for you all of my life. And I tell you, I just melted. Then the second day, you know, he gave me a journal and he said he wanted me to record the history of our relationship so that when we're old, we could pass it down to our favorite grandchild. I was so impressed. And, you know, his parents had been married 45, 50 years, so he didn't even want to talk divorce. And, of course, he was coming in, you know, talking marriage. And he had a good job. I mean, he had all the makings of a man, you know, that would be husband material. And long story short, John was married. Uh- Yeah. And his wife was vacationing in Europe. And when she goes, you know, she stays a long time, like a month or two months and sometimes three months. And I I had no clue. We never went to his house. You know, he always came to my house. And I said, well, tomorrow we're going to your house. I said 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock came and I have not seen John from that day to this one. So what's your advice to women? It is to be careful. Observe, observe, observe. Find out all the truth that you can about a man. And don't go all the way in emotionally. So is the bottom line do a background check? That would be a good thing because, you know, a lot of married men are out there and not being honest, too. Right. So, yes. All right, Tammy. Date or beware. Ron Lopez grew up asking a lot of questions about temptation. And after a lifetime of not getting answers, he did his own research and wrote Temptation Exposed. The eyes have it. A journey into the dark side. So tell me what what's so mysterious about temptation? It's done by spirits. They get into our heads. How is it that they get in our heads? Why do they have free range of our mind? Because I said to the priest, I go, look, I'm a son of God, right? Then why does the devil get in my head and and tempt me all the time? Every human being has thoughts that are injected in their minds that they have no idea are being injected. And the book is called Temptation Exposed. The eyes have it. Because when a temptation comes, in church I was taught, the devil says, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? He never, ever says that, ever when the word I is used, I think it's me. And if I take any thought from any darkness and think it's my thought, that's deception. And I've been deceived. So I cover these things in the book. The book's mission is to expose the hidden facets of temptation so that you can recognize the temptation from your own thoughts. And then once you identified which I is in your head, one of them's bad, one of them's good. And with what I do in the book is decide how you can recognize which one is the true you, which one is the temptation. And and, and if you follow the, this book, you can always identify which, where temptation's coming. All right, so give me an example. Okay, generally at night, I have two cocktails. There are times when I want three cocktails. Is that temptation or is that me <laughs> to get inebriated or not? I, I mean, there's different ways where I can categorically say, no, I don't need another one. That was temptation. I didn't need that. So that was not me. That was temptation. Once you got a habit pattern, it's conscience. And then once you break your conscience pattern, then you go ahead and start doing the things that you normally have done under the habit patterns that you've established throughout your lifetime. This book will help you recognize what is you thinking and injected thoughts, which is temptation. And you can't stop temptation from coming in your mind. You can't stop them. They do not listen to humans. And you never want to converse with one either. They're evil. It's like, give them an inch, they'll take everything. I feel that God God told me to write the book when I was electrocuted. I did die for a few seconds. And when I came back, I I came back a little different. And then I started getting... uh, feelings uh i need to write this book and uh or put these things in writing before it's too late so i i have them in writing and i'm sure if you read them you would be amazed at the things that i wrote you're not going to learn in any church all right ron thanks what's in a text alpha kennedy takes a look at what we're really trying to say in his book text loving so my book, Text Loving, focuses on everyday issues that we face in, in different type of relationship, whether it's on an intimate level or a friendship level. When you say text loving. 
Yes. How does that tie in? It's tied in like everything that we, we do with our electronic phone. We send out different text messages, you know, here and there to friends, you know, to your colleagues, you know, whoever you have in mind of Texans. Because it's what inspired me because I, you know, my close relationship with my friends, my family, and also my son that inspired me mostly because that's what's the only communication for me going about reaching him mostly at times because I was in a dark place at the time going through different situations. And as that situation going on, I also see other people's situation where they use the phone to make themselves feel better at uh, certain things they're going through in life. In a book, you will find, you will know that everything that you face in different relationships, you have like boyfriend and girlfriend. Then you will also have marriage. You know, then you have cheaters, neighbors, entertainment, and family. Those chapters explain different issues that we face in every day. I'll talk about marriage. You know, we all, we all going to have that marriage the way we say, you know, I'm willing to get married. I'm excited to get married, but are you really into getting married? Are you in it, you know, are you in it to truth to the heart or are you just in it? So it takes you into different stages of I do and I don't. And it's explained great story on, on marriage where you, you would know that are you loving this person or you don't really love the person? You know, when you say the, the promises and the forgiveness that they use and then abuse, you know, you know, it takes you deep into it. So that's something it will, it will grab you where you really act in your marriage. I reach out to people and I explain my book. If I see somebody and I, I shake their hands and say, hi, you know, my name is Alpha Kennedy, author of Affects Loving. And if they don't understand the book, I ask them to Google it to see exactly who am I and to read a little preview of the book. All right, Alpha, thank you. Well, that is it for this edition of the Page Publishing Book Club. If you missed anything or you want to recommend an episode to a friend, just go to 710WOR.com and download the podcast. Thanks to all the authors who joined us, and thank you for dropping by. I'll catch you next time. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini.